Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing the documentary Beyond Bars by Brave New Films, and we have two guests. Robert Greenwald is the filmmaker. He's an award-winning producer, director of more than 60 features, television movies, miniseries. His work has garnered awards from organizations, including the ACLU, Physicians for Social Responsibility, in addition to an Office of the Americas Activist in the Trenches Award, a Liberty Hill Upton Sinclair Award, the Robert Wood Johnson's Award, and on and on. Chesa Boudin is the subject of the film. He was District Attorney of San Francisco from January 8th, 2020 to July 8th, 2022, and is now the founding executive director of the Criminal Law and Justice Center at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Boudin was born in 1982. Weather Underground members Kathy Boudin and David Gilbert, who were convicted of murder and went to prison when Chesa Boudin was 14 months old. Robert and Chesa, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. Great to be with you, David. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for making and, and being in this film, uh, which I highly recommend everyone see. Uh, Robert, this film is is both a personal story and a political one. How did you decide to, to make it at all and to make it in, in that way? I decided to try to make the film after reading about the work that Chesa was doing uh, in San Francisco, the important work, the life-changing work for many people, and combining it with this extraordinary personal story of being raised by four parents, two who were locked up and two who were on the outside. I'm the parent of four kids and raising children under any circumstances is a, a unique and awesome challenge. And the fact that the four of them were able to work together under the most uh, extraordinary circumstances, I felt offered an opportunity to reach a larger audience so many people in our country have a relative, a friend, or someone who's been locked up. So I saw the notion of combining the personal and the political as an ideal way. Then it was a question of convincing Chesa that we would not injure him permanently by making this documentary. Uh, Chesa, did Robert keep that promise? And what do you, what were you hoping people would learn from this film? David, the jury's still out on uh, whether Robert kept his promise or not, but uh, I'd say it's, it, it's, it, it, all signs are reassuring. Um, you know, the, the reality, and, and this is, I, I think, the way I look at it, you know, uh, anytime you engage in in work with a journalist, but particularly a filmmaker who's going to spend, what was it, Robert, three years um, yep. right. working on a project that, you know, cameras follow you. Uh, it, it, talk to your family, talk to your friends, look at your work events. Um it's, it's a deeply personal and intimate relationship that you build. And you have to be willing to let somebody and their team and their crew um, follow you around and see you on good days and bad days. And so it's, um, you know, people often will say to me, oh, I, I saw your new movie. I loved it. And I say, well, it's not my movie. It's Robert's movie. I'm the subject. And going into it, I was acutely aware of that. And so I had to trust that Robert would do an honest and decent, as well as uh, technically uh, excellent job in producing this film. I will say every time I watch it, and we've done premieres now in multiple cities across the country, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, Portland, and more, um, I'm, I'm extremely emotional by the end of the film. And so is everybody else in the audience. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's touching, it's powerful. And it's, um, it's a deeply intimate portrait, not only of my career and my family, but it uses that portrait to tell a story that's much deeper and broader, one of the history of racism and oppression and mass incarceration, and more inspiringly, the resistance to all of those forces of evil in our in our society and culture. This, this story of children growing up without parents who are behind bars has all kinds of variations, but is far more common than some people may think. This story is representative of many, many others, right? That's right. I mean, uh, on any given day, there are more 
people with a, there are more children with an incarcerated parent in this country than there are people behind bars. We're talking about well over 2 million kids on any given day. And if you look at the charm, the, the, the turnover of people um, moving in and out of jails, prisons every day, more than 10 million people in this country under the age of 18 have experienced parental incarceration. And, um, you know, in many of the circles that I've been privileged enough to move in when I was at Yale College or Yale Law School, a Rhodes Scholar, uh, certainly as an elected official, my experience with parental incarceration made me an anomaly, an outlier. But in this country as a whole, I'm with the majority. The fact is most adults in this country have experienced the incarceration of someone in their family or or, or who they love. Um, it's a defining part of American culture and the American modern American experience. Robert, is that what you're finding in people's reactions to this film, that they that they can relate to this story? We're finding a wide variety. I think the common denominator is the emotion. And that was one of the things we worked very hard to do over the years. And when people will ask me, what does Brave New Films do? I try to summarize. I said, first and foremost, all of our films always are free. So anybody listening or watching today, you can sign up and have a free screening of the film with a study guide, with a, with a reflection guide. And in order for it to be most effective as a film, not as a PowerPoint or not as a study of any kind, the, you, I believe you need to start by reaching the heart and then the mind will follow. And we are finding that in the screenings, people are responding for a variety of reasons, but they are feeling something about Chesa, about the four parents, about the situation, and about the so many impacted people that he and other really critical DAs are doing, not waiting for some idiot in Washington, D.C. to pass a legislation or not, but they are affecting lives every single day, which is why the attacks against the smart DAs are so significant. Chase, the, the, the policy that's implemented in the story of depriving you as a child of your parents, of locking them up for years and years, seems so ignorant, so misguided. What would have been a, a better policy? What, what ought to have been done and ought to be done in, in similar cases? Well, I, I want to make two points here, David. I mean, the first one is my parents participated in a very, very serious crime. Three people were killed. Um, you know, the, the the average person who's behind bars is not there for a crime anywhere near as serious as the crime my parents committed. Um, the second point is that the United States is one of the only countries in the world that treats people who played the role my parents played in their crime, that of unarmed drivers who didn't physically hurt anybody, that treats them and punishes them exactly the same as if they had themselves pulled the trigger. It's a really uh, inhumane, barbaric doctrine, legal doctrine known as the felony murder doctrine that allows prosecutors and judges to treat someone who may not even be physically present when a crime occurs uh, as though they themselves committed murder. Um, so one thing is we should abolish the felony murder doctrine. We should have what lawyers like to refer to as proportionality. The punishment should be proportional to the role the person played in the crime and to the harm that they caused. So if you pull the trigger, there should be a more serious punishment than if you drive a getaway car. Um, that, that's just logic. That's just basic proportionality. Um, the second thing is that we should recognize that in this country, uh, excuse me, the third thing is we should recognize that in this country, we sentence people to punishments that are uh, vastly longer than are necessary to protect public safety or to serve any reasonable deterrent effect. And that there's no other country in the civilized world that imposes sentence anywhere near as punitive or as harsh as we do. And the reality is that we have many alternatives to incarceration that are less expensive, more humane, more effective at preventing future crime, and that have been explored and tested by rigorous uh, scientific and empirical research. So things like primary caregiver diversion for nonviolent offenses. California in 2020 passed a law. It was the first policy I implemented when I took office as DA, was to say if someone is arrested and being prosecuted for a nonviolent offense, 
and they are a primary caregiver of a dependent child, it is in the public interest to give that person an opportunity to earn a dismissal of criminal charges, to avoid incarceration if they demonstrate a commitment to their families. Take parenting classes, help your kids get back on track in school, stabilize the family unit, and that is in all of our best interests, and we should encourage it, reward it, and incentivize it. We are speaking with Chesa Boudin, who is the subject of the film, and Robert Greenwald, the filmmaker. The film is called Beyond Bars by Brave New Films. You can find it online. This is this is also the story, uh, as the film moves along, of, of an election campaign and that rarest of things, uh, an election campaign success, uh, when the policy, when the campaign platform is radically decent policies um are there are there lessons meant to be to be gained here in in how to make such things less rare well i was curious to see what lessons robert had to share with us uh <laughs> maybe i'm maybe i'm too close to the uh to the topic but uh, i i think uh, from the outside um <clears throat> ha run on a platform that's inspirational, run on a platform that's idea-based, run on a platform that's not poll-tested and consultants telling you use this word or that word, <clears throat> and sp speak authentically. Again, easier said than done. <clears throat> Clearly from the people in the film who worked on the campaign, who Chesa inspired at multiple levels, he hired smart, committed people thousands of volunteers because there was a fundamental idea that people believed in. Locking up more and more people is not making us safer. We're wasting millions and billions of dollars. It's inhumane and it's a failure. If the goal is safety, the evidence is in, it's failing. So what we see in the campaign, almost all women, by the way, who were the centerpiece of it, which I think is important, they committed to the idea and they committed to the person. And if you put the two together, you have a chance for real success. And, you know, David, I'll just echo what Robert said. I'll add one point, which is that, you know, we did, as Robert points out, we did exactly the opposite of the conventional wisdom. In 2019, when I ran for office, um, I was determined to run an issues-based substantive campaign. Most politicians, you look at their election website, you can't even tell what political party they're in, much less what actual policies they're going to implement. And we have the most concrete, specific, detailed policies on our website of any candidate in the race. We did that for a couple of important reasons. One is it's who I am. I, I'm, a, I'm a deep thinker about these issues. I've been impacted by them my entire life. And I wanted to make sure that win or lose the election, we actually shaped the conversation and helped to elevate the nuance in the public square about criminal justice and public safety. And the other thing is I wanted to make sure that if and when we won, when we began implementing our platform, nobody could say they were surprised. This is what we promised. I wanted voters to know what was coming and to be able to hold me and my team accountable to the campaign platform we ran on. And yet, contrary to that transparency and success, there was a recall rather than waiting for the next election and you were able to win the election, but lost the recall. Uh, why? What was the difference between the two? Well, there were a couple of key differences. I mean, one is um, the COVID pandemic. It hit two months after I took office. It reshaped everything about American life, about our criminal system, about the crimes, our courts. Second thing is the campaigns in San Francisco have strict contribution limits. Recalls do not. And the people who organized the recall, the billionaires who backed it, spent well over $10 million all in to generate the possibility of and the success of a recall. And the third thing, and this is really the most important one, David, and the one that's overlooked all the time in the national narrative about my recall and criminal justice reform and progressive prosecutors in general. I was elected in 2019 with 35% of the first choice votes. San Francisco uses ranked choice voting. We don't have a, a primary and a general. So 35% was actually more votes, a higher percentage than any other candidate. When you include the second and third choice votes that I got in 2019, it added up to 42%, 85,000 individual ballots, right? That was enough to win the race. 
Three years later, after the COVID pandemic, after a $10 million recall campaign, I got 45% of the vote or 100,000 individual ballots. We actually increased our support, even though structurally in 2022, we weren't running against any other candidates. I was running against myself. Imagine for a minute, David, I mean, I'm sure many of our listeners today do not love Joe Biden. But I also bet most of them hate and fear Donald Trump. Now, what does that tell us? If Joe Biden is running for president in November, as he is, on the ballot, we can be very confident he's going to get 50 percent plus or minus 2 percent of the vote. If he were running on the ballot against himself, if Trump weren't on the ticket against him, what would he get? I don't know, 30 percent? So what the recall did was it created that structure of an election where voters who were dissatisfied with San Francisco government or with life during the pandemic had an opportunity to cast a protest vote against me without thinking about who the alternative was or what policies they would implement. Almost no politician in America could survive that kind of an election. I think that's a great explanation. Um, but there were some subjects being debated. It seemed, I got the impression that, and I, I have the impression that in academia, it's not controversial that the sort of policies you were proposing and had begun working on reduce crime better than so-called tough on crime policies, but that people's preference uh, after having $10, $10 million spent on it was for screaming tough on crime, even if it was counterproductive, even if it wasn't the way to reduce the most crime, uh, and that this was uh, the trend in in other recalls in Los Angeles and elsewhere, this this sort of counterproductive backward, and if crime goes up, do even more of what makes the crime go up, uh, tough on crime shouts rather than the policies that we actually know reduce crime better. You know, the thing is, David, uh, the politics around um, around criminal justice policy are really driven by fear not by data. And that's a problem. That's a recipe for making bad policy. It's not a new problem. It's one that we've seen going back decades in this country. Um, and one that I confronted every day in trying to implement uh, evidence-based policies in San Francisco. Um, it's not that complicated to figure out that what the recall folks and the allegedly so-called tough on crime folks care about is not actually crime or safety or victims. I mean, let me give you a couple very simple, concrete illustrations of that. When I was the district attorney in San Francisco in 2020 and 2021, crime fell by more than 20% compared to the previous two years. Now, you may say that, well, that's because of the COVID pandemic and nothing to do with your policy. But meanwhile, across the Bay in Oakland, where there was a very traditional tough on crime politician named Nancy O'Malley serving as district attorney, homicides and shootings roughly doubled during that time period. And nobody in Alameda County was talking about recalling Nancy O'Malley. Now you have a reformer in office, in, in the district attorney's office in Alameda County today, and crime rates have not skyrocketed under her the way they did under Nancy O'Malley. And yet people are trying to recall Pamela Price. It, it is simply not about crime rates or crime trends. The people who are determined to defend a failed status quo exploit fear, exploit the failings of the status quo, exploit crimes that we know occur in every part of this country for reasons that have much less to do with who the district attorney is and much more to do with structural inequality, with lack of access to mental health care and treatment and housing, with lack of access to good jobs, with easy access to firearms. Um, and they exploit those crimes in ways that are dishonest and political. Um, Again, another concrete statistical empirical example of the point that I'm making. In California and in this country, homicide rates are far higher in jurisdictions governed by Republican so-called tough on crime prosecutors than in those governed by progressives or Democrats. If not rocket science, the jurisdictions with the death penalty have higher violent crime rates than those without. The, the jurisdictions in California that are red had even property crime rates go up more during the time I was in office 
than did any of the jurisdictions um, that were governed by Democrats or reform prosecutors. The data is very clear. Robert, do you think this film can make enough people aware of these sorts of facts that they are immunized against the fear mongering in their in their localities? Well, it's all on your shoulders, David. If enough of your listeners sign up and screen the film, we 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 will be okay. Um, I think there's a real possibility to use the film effectively. And Chase had just said the key thing, which is they the opposition, I don't want to say tough on crime, I want to say stupid on crime, are relying on emotion, fear. Now, how do you counteract emotion and fear? It's very hard to do it with facts and substance. So our job is more challenging. And that's where I think film, not by itself, does it because it does take a village, I think film can play a role by reaching people's emotions and motivating them to take action, to do different things. I mean, for goodness sakes, how many years and how many people we've locked up and how much money we've spent and things have not gotten better. If you measure things by failure, there's no question, but we have to find ways to reach the heart, to reach emotion and to motivate people to do something, vote, organize, get involved. There's a variety of things that are possible, but the film can really be useful. You can screen it in your homes. You can screen it in church. You can screen it in church, bowling alleys, workplaces, bookstores, co-ops, any place, or just on your phone. It, the technology has really opened up incredibly for us. Absolutely has. What for for activist groups that want to advance the best policies across the country at the state and local level? Are there some that you think have the most potential? I saw that Massachusetts just banned life without parole for under 21 year olds. Uh, 49 more states could do that. What what policies have the most potential uh, to take hold and spread? You know, you know, there's no shortage of, of good work to do in this space. And that's one of the reasons I so love being um, in the criminal justice space, because, the, you know, the status quo is so deeply failed, so expensive, so inhumane, uh, so racist, that there really is um, a lifetime of work to do fixing policies. But let me give you a few very concrete uh, examples of work that I think is critically important and that I focused uh, my time in elected office on and that I continue to do work on today. Uh, as the executive director of the Criminal Law and Justice Center. So one thing is reducing reliance on incarceration as a primary response to so many of our social problems. Um, what that means in practice is expanding diversion programs, expanding alternatives to incarceration, treatment programs, um, pushing for treatment on demand for homeless shelters, homes instead of handcuffs. Uh, a second thing that's critically important as we reduce incarceration, as we save resources um, and and, and close jails and prisons, um, we need to invest some of those savings in meaningful support for victims of crime. And that means everything from helping store owners whose windows are broken to, to, to pay their insurance deductible, to ensuring that families who've lost a loved one or survivors of sexual violence have long-term therapy costs covered by the state so that they can recover from the trauma and the harm and live their lives with dignity. Um, and then finally, I think another area that's absolutely ripe for criminal justice reform policy is meaningful enforcement of the laws in a way that uh, is equitable. Right now, we have two systems of justice, one for the rich and powerful and another one for everybody else. And that is not justice. It makes a mockery of the words that are chiseled in stone above every courthouse in America, equal protection, under law. That means police officers wearing uniforms and carrying guns who commit crimes have to be held accountable. It means politicians who are corrupt have to be held accountable. It means billionaires in their boardrooms who are engaging in massive, massive scale wage theft have to be held accountable. We cannot continue to have a system of so-called justice where the only people who are held accountable are those who are poor or black and brown. I, I want to just uh, add to that. I don't think we, one thing we haven't emphasized enough 
is the racism in the system. This would not be going on at this level if we were talking about white people. Certainly poverty is an element of it, but it is based and built on the back of racism. And one of the many things the film can do, by the way, and groups around the country are doing this, is you can use the film to fundraise for your group, for your issue, for your cause, for your elected official. And the film is free to everybody, thanks to our generous donors, with that very idea, how to spread it as far and wide as possible, so as many groups and as many people use it as a step along the way to dismantling and fighting the essential racist structure that we're dealing with. And we've got just about two minutes left and you've got a, a, a kit to help people do the screenings. Um, what's, what's involved there and can people invite the two of you to speak? They can, they, they can go online, they can sign up. We went, sent an email out last week. I think we already have 50, 60 screenings around the country. Our goal is to have hundreds between now and the rest of the year. And all they need to do is sign up. And if they want to get a video or a, have one of us speak uh, easier online than it is in person because of people's schedules, but um, at least I can, I know for sure each of us are going to try to do as much as we can. And then there's lots of additional material that we've taped. We've had conversations after screenings um, and it's all there and it's all free. We've had elected prosecutors, we've had formerly incarcerated people, we've had movement leaders speak at these events. Um, you know, all these policies we've talked about today cannot be achieved if we don't do the work of educating and empowering folks in our communities. And so I want to just emphasize, you know, Robert's point. This is a film that can serve as a tool to educate, to empower, to mobilize, and to be a catalyst for change. We have been speaking with Chesa Boudin, former district attorney of San Francisco, and with Robert Greenwald of Brave New Films. The film is called Beyond Bars. You can find it online at Brave New Films, and I recommend watching it and screening it and planning big events to screen it. And you are apparently free to raise money for your own organization with it. So do what you can uh, to spread the word. Chesa and Robert, thank you very, very much for making the movie and coming on Talk World Radio. Thank, thank you. you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.